On Christmas night all Christians sing To hear the news the angels bring On Christmas night all Christians sing To hear the news the angels bring News of great joy, news of great mirth News of the merciful King's birth then why should men on earth be so sad since our Redeemer made us glad? Then why should men on earth be so sad since our Redeemer made us glad? When from our sin he set us free, all for to gain our liberty. Hello and welcome to Day 7 of the Craftlet Christmas Extravaganza. We are more than halfway through. If you are just joining us, there is audio galore waiting for you at craftlit.com and also at our annotated audiobook podcast YouTube channel. Today we have another piece by Elizabeth M. Laws Hibbard, like we did on day six, uh, also known as Faith Wynne, W-Y-N-N-E. Uh, this is another one of her kind of teaching stories. It also has knitting involved in it. <laughs> which, for those Craftlet listeners who are listening to the Christmas stories, here you go. You got your knitting. We had quilting earlier, now we've got knitting. And if you are not a crafty, knitty person, it doesn't matter. A need for a knowledge of knitting does not come into play in this story. And then we will end with a longer, funny piece called The Thin Santa Claus or The Chicken Yard That Was a Christmas Stocking. This was written in 1909 by Ellis Parker Butler. It has some awfully clever dialogue and wordplay going on in it, and some dialects, which uh, some some of the readers are stronger at than others, but I think you can tell what's going on. It's an interestingly diverse neighborhood, uh, Irish and German at the very least, which makes sense because Ellis Parker Butler was born in Iowa, but then he moved to New York City, and he lived out in Flushing, Queens, but he was a banker. And so he had a lot of contact with a lot of people from a lot of different places, and clearly listened and picked up on stuff. And that was kind of an interesting thing, because while he was a banker, that means he was only a part-time writer, but he was really prolific. And again, this is one of those places where you kind of think, wow, these people were so famous during their lifetime. And I don't know about you, but I hadn't heard about him before. So it's a good thing there are shows like Forgotten Classics. And his work, he wasn't just prolific. He was really well known. He, When he published in magazines, his stuff was in the same magazines as Mark Twain's stuff, as F. Scott Fitzgerald's stuff, Edgar Rice Burroughs. I mean, he was right up there with the biggies and... And yet, and I think one of the reasons why he probably hasn't been remembered quite as strongly is a lot of his stuff was written for, or at least appeared in, women's magazines, kind of like Ladies' Home Journal. And as we know from history in general, women's stuff didn't have the stick to itness as far as literature goes. This is Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, but it's also... What was happening in the 80s and in the 90s with going back into regional authors and finding stories about women and stories written by women. This is when Herland was released and Their Eyes Were Watching God. Way back at the beginning of Craftlet, we talked about the regionalist writers, the story Miss Beulah's Bonnet that gets compared favorably to Huck Finn as far as being able to master dialect and tell a, a very regional story. You know, a lot of this stuff just went by the wayside, and it's kind of nice that at least some of it got brought back, and it's especially nice that we have a place like LibriVox where people who have discovered these hidden treasures have been able to record them for us. So, Elizabeth M. Laws Hibbard, also known as Faith Wynne, and Ellis Parker Butler, and their two stories, The Eve of St. Nicholas and The Thin Santa Claus, or The Chicken Yard That Was a Christmas Stocking. Here you go. Fireside Christmas Short Stories The Eve of St. Nicholas by Faith Wynne Recording by Ruth Golding In a neat little house in an old-fashioned German village on the banks of the beautiful Rhine, 
with flat meadows and broad fields and roads bordered with tall poplars, there lived a happy family by the name of Lichtenfels. There were two daughters named Christine and Alice, the sunlight of the home where clouds were rare. One month, however, before the advent of St. Nicholas Day, something unusual occurred, and this something was a troubled pucker on the white forehead of little Alice, and as she watched the nimble fingers of Christine slipping the stitches off and on, on and off her shining needles, she sighed so deeply that the sister asked anxiously, "'What ails thee, Liebchen?' "'I am so afraid that St. Nicholas will ask me again this year if I can knit,' she replied with a quiver in her voice. "'So he will, Alice, so he will. And what canst thou answer? The mother wanted to teach thee, but thou wouldst not learn. I know I was naughty not to obey. If I learn now, will St. Nicholas pardon me? I am sure he will.' "'Then I will learn before the month is out,' said Alice, skipping after Christine to get the yarn and needles. And a pretty picture the mother found when she entered the room a while later. The smiling sisters were seated side by side on the wooden settee. Christine's arms were half bared, for it was one of those warm October days which with us will call the squirrel and the bee from out their winter home and her fair head was bowed until it almost touched the flaxen locks of the child, her face eager and flushed as she guided the awkward little fingers through the stitches that seemed so determined to drop out of line. Patience and perseverance are fine partners and generally accomplish their aim. When the eve of the 5th of November rolled around, Alice was ready to enjoy with an untroubled heart the sights in the window of the Conditorai, confectioner's shop, where many little wooden-shod feet pattered that night to buy a chocolate shoe and to admire the picture cakes of immense roosters with flowing tails and lordly crests, ladies in ruffs and knights in armour with sword and lance, St. Nicholas on a white horse being the most frequent figure. These picture cakes are made in wooden moulds, thick square blocks of wood with the form to be made deeply cut into them. The dough is pressed firmly into this cutting until it takes its shape when it is removed and baked. Most plentiful of all the pretty toys are little candy shoes, generally made of brown chocolate with white rosettes and trimmings, which are always expected to be provided to hold food for St. Nicholas's white horse when the good saint comes in the night with his gifts, and sad is the heart of the child who cannot find a groschen to buy one. There was such a one standing close to Christine, who whispered that she could not afford a chocolate shoe, so she had made one of potato and would put the oats in it, adding the fervent hope that St. Nicholas would not be angry. Of course he will not, said Christine. He will know you did your best, and that is all any of us can do. That night there were many children in this little village in a state of great excitement, filling the shoes for the white steed with rye or oats or sugar, and blacking their own until they could almost see themselves in them, which were then placed upon a table beside their beds close to the chocolate shoes. This preparation is made with their hearts in their mouths, for they are expecting any moment to hear St. Nicholas's bell announcing his approach. Finally it comes, ting-a-ling-ling, sounding clearly in the still night air. The door is opened politely by the mother who bids him enter. At one side he carries a long, well-filled bag, and in one hand a bundle of rods. He bows graciously and says as Christmas is so near, the Christkind has sent him to each home to see where he must bring presents on that blessed day. He asks the trembling Alice, who clings to her mother's arm, whether she has yet learned to knit, and a smile passes over his face when she almost shrieks out in her excitement and earnestness, Yes, yes, good St. Nicholas, 
he then assures her that she and all the good children will find a gift from out his well-filled sack beside their beds in the morning, which will be as a promise to them that on Christmas Eve the Christ-child will bring more beautiful presents. The day scarcely dawns before the village children begin to peep around, and alas for the naughty ones who find only a bundle of sticks. The good boys and girls, however, are delighted with the picture cakes that adorn the little stand at their bedside. Laid carefully across the top of Alice's shoe is a large cake made in the shape of a stocking, marked for the little girl who has learned the useful art of knitting and the potato shoe in a poorer part of the village is filled with the sweetest of sweets, and a card lay beside it, upon which was written, she did the best she could. When Christmas Day came, with all its hopes and fears for the childish heart, the promises of St. Nicholas were fulfilled. The Christ child remembered the good with bounteous and beauteous gifts, and the birch rods left by old Pelt's Nicol, we may believe, kept the naughty children in order the next year. But, you know, that is not the most acceptable goodness which grows out of a desire of reward or fear of punishment. May the glad Christmas find you and keep you good, because it is right to be good. THE THIN SANTA CLAUS, OR THE CHRISTMAS YARD THAT WAS A CHRISTMAS STOCKING, BY ELLIS PARKER BUTLER. Mrs. Grotz opened her eyes and looked out at the drizzle that made the Christmas morning gray. Her bed stood against the window, and it was easy for her to look out. All she had to do was to roll over and pull the shade aside. Having looked at the weather, she rolled again on to the broad flat of her back and made herself comfortable for a while, for there was no reason why she should get up until she felt like it. Such a Christmas, she said good-naturedly to herself. I guess such weathers is bad for Santa Claus. Maybe it is because of such weathers he don't come by my house. I don't blame him. So muddy. She let her eyes close indolently. Not yet was she hungry enough to imagine the tempting odor of fried bacon and eggs, and she idly slipped into sleep again. She was in no hurry. She was never in a hurry. What is the use of being in a hurry when you own a good little house and have money in the bank and are a widow? What is the use of being in a hurry anyway? Mrs. Grotz was always placid and fat, and she always had been. What is the use of having money in the bank and a good little house if you are not placid and fat? Mrs. Grotz lay on her back and slept, placidly and fatly, with her mouth open, as if she expected Santa Claus to pass by and drop a present into it. Her dreams were pleasant. It was no disappointment to Mrs. Grotz that Santa Claus had not come to her house. She had not expected him. She did not even believe in him. Yes, she had told Mrs. Flannery next door, as she handed a little parcel of toys over the fence for the little Flannerys. Once I believes in such a Santa Claus myself yet. I make me pretty good times then, but now I'm too old. I don't believe in such things, but I make pretty good times still. I have a good little house and money in the bank. Suddenly, Mrs. Grotz closed her mouth and opened her eyes. She smelled imaginary bacon frying. She felt real hunger, and slid out of bed and began to dress herself, and she had just buttoned her red flannel petticoat around her wide waist when she heard a silence, and paused. For a full minute she stood, trying to realize what the silence meant. The English sparrows were chirping as usual, and making enough noise, but through their bickerings the silence still annoyed Mrs. Grotz, and then, Quite suddenly again, she knew. Her chickens were not making their usual morning racket. I bet you I know what it is, sure, she said, and continued to dress as placidly as before. When she went down, she found that she had won the bet. A week before, two chickens had been stolen from her coop, and she had had a strong padlock put on the chicken house. Now the padlock was pried open, and 
and the chicken house was empty, and nine hens and a rooster were gone. Mrs. Grotz stooped and entered the low gate and surveyed the vacant chicken yard placidly. If they were gone, they were gone. Such a Santa Claus, she said good naturedly. I don't like such a Santa Claus taking away and not bringing. Pretty soon he don't have such a good name any more if he keeps up doing like this. People likes the bringing Santa Claus. I guess they don't think much of the taking away business. He gets a bad name quick enough if he does this much. She turned to bend her head to look into the vacant chicken house and stood still. She put out her foot and touched something her eyes had lighted upon, and the thing moved. It was a purse of worn black leather, soaked by the drizzle, but still holding the bend that comes to men's purses when worn long in a back trouser pocket. One end of the purse was muddy and pressed deep into the soft soil where a heel was tramped on it. Mrs. Grotz bent and picked it up. There was nine hundred dollars in bills in the purse. Mrs. Grotz stood still while she counted the bills, and as she counted, her hands began to tremble and her knees shook, and she sank on the door sill of the chicken house and laughed until the tears rolled down her face. Occasionally she stopped to wipe her eyes, and the flood of laughter gradually died away into ripples of intermittent giggles that were like sobs after sorrow. Mrs. Grotz had no great sense of humor, but she could see the fun of finding nine hundred dollars. It was enough to make her laugh, so she laughed. Goodness, such a Santa Claus! she exclaimed with a final sigh of pleasure. Such a Christmas present from Santa Claus! No wonder he is so fat yet when he eats ten chickens in one night already, but I don't kick. I like me that Santa Claus all right. I believes in him pretty good after this, I bet. She went at once to tell Mrs. Flannery, and Mrs. Flannery was far more excited about it than Mrs. Grotz had been. She said it was the hand of retribution paying back the chicken thief, and the hand of justice repaying Mrs. Grotz for sending toys to the little Flannerys, and pure luck giving Mrs. Grotz what she always got, and a number of other things. Tis the luck of you, Mrs. Grotz, ma'am, she said. And often I do be saying, it is the Dutch for luck, meaning no disrespect to you, and the father the luckier, as I often told me old man. Rest his soul. And him so thin. And Christmas morning at that, ma'am. Which is nothing at all but the judgment of having on the dirty chicken thief. Packing such a day for his thieving. When there's plenty other days in the year for him. Keep the money, ma'am. For it is yours by good rights. And I knew there'd be some good come till you. The minute you handed me the presents for the kids. The good folks sure all gets their reward in this world. Only some don't. And I'm only sorry man is a pig instead of chickens. But not wishing you had the money yourself at all, but who would come to steal a pig? And them, such loud squealers. And who do you suspicion it was, Mrs. Gratz, ma'am? I think maybe I got me a present from Santa Claus, yes? said Mrs. Grotz. And hear the woman, said Mrs. Flannery. Do you hear that now? Well, true for you, ma'am, and stuck to it. There's no telling who'll be claiming the money. And if ever Santa Claus brought a thing to a mortal soul, twas him brought you that. And twas only yesterday you were saying you'd no belief in him. Yesterday I don't have no beliefs in him, said Mrs. Grotz. Today I have plenty of beliefs in him. I like him plenty. I don't care if he comes every year. Sure not, said Mrs. Flannery. And you with the nine hundred dollars in your pocket. I'd be glad of the chance. I'd believe in him myself for four hundred and fifty. That afternoon, Mrs. Flannery, whose excitement had not abated in the least, went over to Mrs. Grotz to spend the afternoon talking to her about the money. She felt that it was good to be that near it at any rate, and when one can make a whole afternoon's conversation out of what Mrs. Casey said to Mrs. O'Reilly about Mrs. McNeely, it is a shame to miss a chance to talk about nine hundred dollars. Mrs. Flannery was rocking violently and talking rapidly, 
and Mrs. Grotz was slowly moving her rocker and answering in monosyllables when someone knocked at the door. Mrs. Grotz answered the knock. Her visitor was a tall, thin man, and he had a slouch hat, which he held in his hands as he talked. He seemed nervous, and his face wore a worried look, extremely worried. He looked like a man who had lost nine hundred dollars, but he did not look like Santa Claus. He was thinner and not so jolly looking. At first, Mrs. Grotz had no idea that Santa Claus was standing before her, for he did not have a sleigh bell about him, and he had left his red cotton coat with the white batting trimming at home. He stood in the door playing with his hat, unable to speak. He seemed to have some delicacy about beginning. Well, what is it? said Mrs. Grotz. Her visitor pulled himself together with an effort. Well, ma'am, I'll tell you, he said frankly. I'm a chicken buyer. I buy chickens. That's my business, dealing in poultry. So I came out today to buy some chickens. On Christmas Day? asked Mrs. Grotz. Well, said the man, moving uneasily from one foot to the other. I did come on Christmas Day, didn't I? I don't deny that, ma'am. I did come on Christmas Day. I'd like to go out and have a look at your chickens. It ain't so usual for buyers to come buying chickens on Christmas Day, is it? Interposed Mrs. Grotz good naturedly. Well, no, it ain't, and that's a fact, said the man uneasily. But I always do. The people I buy chickens for is just as apt to want to eat chicken one day as another day, and more so. Turkey on Christmas Day and chicken the next for a change. That's what they always tell me. So I have to buy chickens every day. I hate to, but I have to, and if I could just go out and look around your chicken yard. It was right there that Mrs. Grotz had a suspicion that Santa Claus stood before her. But I don't sell such a chicken yard yet, she said. The man wiped his forehead. Sure not, he said nervously. I was going to say, look around your chicken yard and see the chickens. I can't buy chickens without I see them, can I? Some folks might, but I can't with the kind of customers I've got. I've got mighty particular customers, and I pay extra prices so as to get the best for them. And when I go out and look around the chicken yard. How much you pay for such nice, big, fat chickens, maybe? asked Mrs. Grotz. Well, I'll tell you, said the man. Seven cents a pound is regular, ain't it? Well, I pay twelve. I'll give you twelve cents and pay you right now and take all the chickens you've got. That's my rule. But if you want to let me go out and see the chickens first and pick out the kind my regular customers like, I pay twenty cents a pound. But I won't pay twenty cents without I can see the chickens first. Sure, said Mrs. Grotz. I wouldn't do it too. Maybe I go out and bring in a couple such chickens for you to look at, yes? No, don't, said the man impulsively. Don't do it. It wouldn't be no good. I've got to see the chickens on the hoof, as I might say. On the hoofs? said Mrs. Grotz. Such poultry don't have no hoofs. Running around, explained the visitor. Running around in the coop. I can tell if a chicken has got any disease that my trade wouldn't like if I see it running around in the coop. There's a lot in the way a chicken runs, in the way it hiss up its legs, for instance. That's what the trade calls it, on the hoof. So I'll just go out and have a look around the coop. For twenty cents a pound, anybody could let buyers see their chickens on the hoof, I guess, said Mrs. Grotz. Now that's the way to talk, exclaimed the man. Only I ain't got any such chickens, said Mrs. Grotz. So it ain't of use to look how they walk. So goodbye. Now say, said the man, but Mrs. Grotz closed the door in his face. I guess such a Santa Claus come back yet, said Mrs. Grotz when she went into the room where Mrs. Flannery was sitting. But it ain't any use. He don't leave many more such presents. The impotence of him, exclaimed Mrs. Flannery. For nine hundred dollars, I could be impudent too," said Mrs. Grotz calmly. "But I don't like such nowadays Santa Clauses coming back all the time. Once, when I believes in Santa Clauses, they don't come back so much." The thin Santa Claus had not gone far. He had crossed the street and stood gazing at Mrs. Grotz's door, and now he crossed again and knocked. Mrs. Grotz arose and went to the door. "I believe he comes back once yet." 
she said to Mrs. Flannery, and opened the door. He had indeed come back. Now see here, he said briskly. Ain't your name Mrs. Gratz? Well, I knowed it was, and I knowed you was a widow lady, and that's why I said I was a chicken buyer. I didn't want to frighten you, but I ain't no chicken buyer. No? asked Mrs. Gratz. No, I ain't. I just said that so I could get a look at your chicken yard. I've got to see it. What I am is chicken house inspector for the Ninth Ward, and the mayor sent me up here to inspect your chicken house, and I've got to do it before I go away or lose my job. I'll go right out now, and it'll be all over in a minute. I guess it ain't some use, said Mrs. Grotz. I guess I don't keep any more chickens. They go too easy. Yesterday I have plenty, and today I haven't any. That's it, said the thin Santa Claus. That's just it. That's the way tuberculosis bugs act, quick like that. They're a bad epidemic, tuberculosis bugs is. You see how they act. Yesterday you have chickens, and last night the tuberculosis bugs gets at them, and this morning they've eat them all up. Goodness, exclaimed Mrs. Grotz without emotion. With the feathers and the bones, too? Sure, said the thin Santa Claus. Why, them tuberculosis bugs is perfectly ravenous. Once they get started, they eat feathers and bones and feet and all. A chicken hasn't no chance at all. That's why the mayor sent me up here. He heard all your chickens was gone, and gone quick. And he says to me, tuberculosis bugs, that's what he says. And he says, you ain't doing your duty. You ain't inspecting Mrs. Gratz's chicken coop. You go and do it or you're fired, see? He says that, and he says, you inspect Mrs. Gratz's coop. And you kill off them bugs before they get into her house and eat her all up, bones and all. And feathers? asked Mrs. Grotz calmly. No, he didn't say feathers. This ain't nothing to fool about. It's serious. So I'll go right out and have a look. I guess such bugs ain't been in my coop last night, said Mrs. Grotz carelessly. I ain't afraid of such bugs in winter time. Well, that's where you make your mistake, said the thin Santa Claus. Winter is just the bad time for them bugs. The more a tuberculosis bug freezes up, the more dangerous it is. In summer, they ain't so bad. They're soft-like and squash up when a chicken gets them. But in winter, they freeze up hard and get brittle. Then a chicken comes along and grabs one, and it busts into a thousand pieces, and each piece turns into a new tuberculosis bug and busts into a thousand pieces and so on, and the chicken gets all filled full of tuberculosis bugs before it knows it. When a chicken snaps up one tuberculosis bug, it has a million in it inside of half an hour, and that chicken don't last long. And when the bugs make for the house, what's that on your dress there now? Mrs. Grotz looked at her arm indifferently. Nothing, she said. I thought maybe it was a tuberculosis bug had got on you already, said the thin Santa Claus. If it was, you would be all eat up inside of half an hour. Them bugs is awful rapacious. Yes? inquired Mrs. Grotz with interest. Such strong bugs, too, is it not? You bet they are strong, began the stranger. I should think so, interrupted Mrs. Grotz. To smash up padlocks on such chicken houses, you make me afraid of such bugs. I don't dare let you go out there to get your bones and feet all eat up by them. I guess not. Well, you see, you see, said the thin Santa Claus, puzzled, and then he cheered up. You see, I ain't afraid of them. I've been fumigated against them. Fumigated and antiskepticized. I've been vaccinated against them by the Board of Health. I'll show you the mark on my arm if you want to see it. No, don't, said Mrs. Grotz. I let you go and look in that chicken coop if you want to, but it ain't no use. There ain't nothing there. The thin Santa Claus paused and looked at Mrs. Grotz with suspicion. Why, did you find it? He asked. Find what? asked Mrs. Grotz innocently, and the thin Santa Claus sighed and walked around to the back of the house. Mrs. Grotz went with him. As Mrs. Grotz watched the thin man search the chicken yard for tuberculosis bugs, all doubt that he was her Santa Claus left her mind. He made a most minute investigation, but he did it more as a man might search for a lost purse than as a health officer would search for germs. He even got down on his hands and knees and poked under the chicken house with a stick. And, when he had combed the chicken yard thoroughly and had looked all through the chicken house, 
He even searched the denuded vegetable garden in the back yard and looked over the fence into Mrs. Flannery's yard. Evidently, he was not pleased with his investigation, for he did not even say goodbye to Mrs. Grotz, but went away looking mad and cross. When Mrs. Grotz went into her house, she took her seat in her rocking chair and began rocking herself calmly and slowly. To was hemmed on a chair, said Mrs. Flannery. I don't like such come agains much, said Mrs. Grotz placidly. I try me to believe in such a Santa Claus, but I like not such come agains. In Germany, did not Santa Claus come back so much? I don't like a Santa Claus should be so anxious. Still, I believes in him, but if he has too many such come agains, I don't believe in him much. I would be setting the place on him, Santa Claus or no Santa Claus, said Mrs. Flannery vindictively. The main chicken thief. Oh. "'said Mrs. Grotz easily. "'I guess I don't care much. "'Should a nine-hundred-dollar Santa Claus steal some chickens? "'I ain't mad.' "'But she was a little provoked "'when another knock came at the door a few minutes later, "'and when, on opening it, "'she saw the thin Santa Claus before her again. "'So,' she said, "'Santa Claus is back yet once.' "'What's that?' asked the man suspiciously. "'I say, what is it you want?' said Mrs. Grotz. Oh, said the man. Well, I ain't a-going to fool with you no longer, Mrs. Grotz. I'm a-going to tell you right out what I am and who I am. I'm a detective of the police, and I'm looking up a mighty bad character. I guess I know right where you find one, said Mrs. Grotz politely. Now, don't be funny, said the thin Santa Claus peevishly. Maybe you noticed I didn't say nothing when you spoke about that padlock being busted. Maybe you noticed how careful I looked over your chicken coop and how I looked over the fence into the next yard? Well, I won't fool you. I ain't no chicken yard inspector, and I ain't no chicken buyer. Them was just my detective disguises. I'm out detecting a chicken thief, just a plain, ordinary chicken thief, and what I come for is clues. Yes, said Mrs. Grotz. And what is it, such clues? I haven't any clueses. The thin Santa Claus seemed provoked. Now look here, he said. You may think this is funny, but it isn't. I have got to catch that chicken thief or I'll lose my job, and I can't catch him unless I have some clues to catch him with. Now didn't you have some chickens stolen last night? Chickens? asked Mrs. Grotz. No, I didn't have chickens stolen. Such tuberculosis bugs eat them, with feathers too and bones, right off the hoofs. Ain't it a pity? It may have been a blush of shame, but it was more like a flush of anger that overspread the face of the thin Santa Claus. He stared hard at the placid German face of Mrs. Grotz and decided she was too stupid to mean it, that she was not teasing him. You don't catch on, he said. You see, there ain't any such things as tuberculosis bugs. I just made that up as sort of detective disguise. Them chickens wasn't eat by no bugs at all. They was stole, see? A chicken thief come right into the coop and stole them. Do you think any kind of bug could pry off a padlock? Mrs. Grotz seemed to let this sink into her mind and to revolve there and get to feeling at home before she answered. No, she said at length. I guess not. But Santa Claus could do it. Such a big fat man. Sure he could do it. Why, you... began the thin man crossly and then changed his tone. There ain't no such thing as Santa Claus, he said as one might speak to a child. But even a chicken thief would not tell a child such a thing, I hope. No, queried Mrs. Grotz sadly. No, Santa Claus? And I was scared of it myself with such tuberculosis bugs around. He should not to have gone into such a chicken coop with so many bugs busting up all over. He had a right to have fumigated himself once, and now he ain't. He's all eat up, on the hoof, bones and feet and all, and such a kind man, too. The thin Santa Claus frowned. He had half an idea that Mrs. Grotz was fooling with him. And when he spoke, it was crisply. Now see here, he said. Last night somebody broke into your chicken coop and stole all your chickens. I know that. And he's been stealing chickens all around this town and all around this part of the country, too. And I know that. And this stealing has got to stop. I've got to catch that thief, and to catch him, I've got to have a clue. A clue is something he has left around or dropped 
where he was stealing. Now, did that chicken thief drop any clues in your chicken yard? That's what I want to know. Did he drop any clues? Maybe if he dropped some clues, those tuberculosis bugs eat them up, suggested Mrs. Grotz. They eats bones and feathers. Maybe they eat clues, too. Now, ain't that smart, sneered the thin Santa Claus. Don't you think you're funny? But I'll tell you the clue I'm looking for. Did that thief drop a pocketbook or anything like that? Oh, a pocketbook, said Mrs. Grotz. How much should be in such a pocketbook, maybe? Nine hundred dollars, said the thin Santa Claus promptly. Goodness, exclaimed Mrs. Grotz. So much money all in one clues. Come out to the chicken yard once. I'll help hunt for clues too. The thin Santa Claus stood a minute looking doubtfully at Mrs. Grotz. Her face was large and placid and unemotional. Well, he said with a sigh, "It ain't much use, but I'll try it again." When he had gone after another close search of the chicken yard and coop, Mrs. Grotz returned to her friend Mrs. Flannery. "Pretty soon, I don't believe any more in Santa Claus at all," she said. "Pretty soon, I have more beliefs in chicken thieves than in Santa Claus. Yet a while I believes in him, but one more of those come agains, and I don't." "He'll not be coming back any more." Said Mrs. Flannery positively, "I'm wondering he came at all. The deal's so handy. All you have to do is call a cop." "Sure," said Mrs. Grotz. "But it is not nice. I should put Santa Claus in jail. Such a liberal Santa Claus too." "Have it your own way, ma'am," said Mrs. Flannery. "I'll own to some different when chickens are stole. It's hard to expend the affections on a bunch of chickens, but if anyone was to steal my pig." To jail he would go, Santa Claus or no Santa Claus, not but what you have a kind heart anyway, ma'am. Not wanting to put the fur fella in jail, but he's already lost nine hundred dollars, which, goodness knows, you might have to hand back. Was the law to take hand on it? So, said Mrs. Grotz, such is the law yet. All right, I don't believe in chicken thieves, no matter how much he comes back again. I stick me to Santa Claus. Always will I believe in Santa Claus. Chicken thieves gives and wants to take away again, but Santa Claus is always giving and never taking. You are forgetting the chickens that was took," suggested Mrs. Flannery. "Took," said Mrs. Grotz. "Tooken," Mrs. Flannery corrected. "Tooked," said Mrs. Grotz. "I believes me not in Santa Claus that way. I believes he is a good old man." For givings, I believe in Santa Claus, but for takings, I believe in tuberculosis bugs. And the busted padlock, then? Asked Mrs. Flannery. Ach! Exclaimed Mrs. Grotz. Them reindeers is so frisky yet. They have a right to kick up and bust it, maybe. Mrs. Flannery sighed. Tis a grand thing to have faith, ma'am. She said. Yes. Said Mrs. Grotz indolently. That's nice, and it is nice to have nine hundred dollars more in the bank, ain't it? End of the Thin Santa Claus, or the Chicken Yard that was a Christmas Stocking, by Ellis Parker Butler. Narration read by Betsy Bush. Mrs. Flattery by Laura. Mrs. Grotz, read by Kara Schallenberg. Thin Santa is read by Bill Coon. When from us in he set us free, oh, for to gain a liberty. When sin departs before his grace, then life and hell come in its place. When sin departs before his grace, then life and hell come in its place. Angels and men with joy may sing. All for to see the newborn King. All out of darkness we have light, which made the angels sing this night. All out of darkness we have light, which made the angels sing this night. Glory to God and peace to men, now and forevermore. Amen. This recording is in the public domain.